You're listening to the Unmute Podcast with Maisha Cherry. Welcome to the place where philosophy and real world issues collide. Hello, and welcome to the Unmute Podcast. This is the place where I have the opportunity to talk to young, diverse philosophers about the social and political issues of our day. Today, I chat with Nancy Bauer. Nancy is a professor of philosophy and dean of academic affairs for arts and sciences at Tufts University. She is interested in thinking about what philosophy is and what role it plays or should or might play in everyday human life. Her writing explores these issues, especially as they arise in reflection about gender and philosophy, the history of philosophy, and philosophy of film. Her latest book is How to Do Things with Pornography. In this episode, we talk about pornography, objectification, hookup culture, and much more. Hello, Nancy, and welcome to the Unme Podcast. How are you? I'm great, Maisha. Thanks so much for having me. How are you? I'm doing well. Thank you for coming on. How did you get interested in philosophy? Oh, man, it's kind of a long story, but I'll try to tell the short (laughs) version. Um, I was always kind of interested in social justice, and I was an undergraduate major at Harvard in social studies. But I, and so I read a lot of social theory, sociology theory. Um, And um, I enjoyed doing that. I learned a lot. But what I really wanted to do, I found out, was be a newspaper reporter. So I basically spent all my time um, working on the Harvard Crimson. And um, by the time I was at the end of that uh, experience, I was the managing editor of the Harvard Crimson. And I was a woman with five men working for me. This is how some of my feminist consciousness (laughs) developed, even though they were all like really great guys. Um, And then I got a job on the Boston Globe. Um, I started working for them actually um, in the summer between my junior and senior years. And I worked for them my entire senior year and for uh, a year or two after that. And um, for various reasons, I became kind of disillusioned with journalism. One is that I had to write a lot of stories on children who had died. Um, and of course, whenever a child dies, that's a bad thing. Um, but I often uh, had to report on stories in which children died in really horrific ways. And sometimes I had to go and, you know, ask all the neighbors if there was anything suspicious about the family. And I was really troubled by that practice. Then Also, there was a lot of sexism on the globe at the time, which the women reporters who were there, some of whom are still there, actually, even though this was a long time ago, just kind of took as a matter of course. So a story I often tell is that on a number of days, uh, all of the guys who sat on the city desk, which was a very, very, very long, basically, table, sort of like a judge's table at uh, the Olympics, would have uh, piles of paper in front of them. And when women would walk by, they would raise hold of up like Olympic judges, oh, like wow. 10, eight. Yeah. And you didn't know what, what they were even thinking about. Was it, you know, as I say, boob day, butt day, you didn't know. And the thing is, this was in the early 1980s before the notion of sexual harassment had really gained, become common currency in the culture. And so the experience was something for which, we didn't have a language. You kind of felt ashamed and angry and confused and humiliated and outraged all at once. But you didn't, not having that bit of language as, um, made it seem as though this was kind of an individual way that you were responding to an experience that was just very confusing. And I think uh, later on that would come to be very meaningful to me that the way we talk about things kind of helps us uh, as, as sort of, existentially or phenomenologically really powerful, what we call things really, really matters and changes um, what they are. And so I eventually, I, and I also had a, a, the city editor there literally he was supposed to drive me somewhere. He took me to a restaurant instead. He point blank said to me, if you sleep with me, I will um, get you a job on the New York Times, to which I responded actually quite innocently. I said, I know a lot of people who work for the New York Times. I could work there now. (laughs) And then he insisted on driving me home, and I couldn't figure out how to get out of it. It was very confusing. And then he tried to break into my building. I had to really pull hard. Yeah, so it was 
And I went into the Globe the next day and I talked to this about this with a number of women reporters again, most of whom are still actually there. And they were like, well, you know, what do you expect? He's done that kind of thing to me. And so this freaked me out. So for any number of reasons, I left Globe and I went to work um, at Children's Hospital in Boston. And I worked with several other people writing a book about children's health for parents. And this involved research in the Countway Medical Library at Harvard, but also, sorry about that noise, a lot of uh, conversation with doctors at Children's. And I wrote all of the entries for this comprehensive book that were on children, childhood psychiatric disorders. And there was a phenomenon that many of the doctors were talking to me about that had to do with the way that claiming uh, reimbursement from insurance companies had, had dramatically changed in in recent years at that time. So what happened is that uh, it used to be the case that your, your doctor could just write a note to the insurance company saying, you know, Nancy's nose is running and she's coughing a lot and she has some kind of cold or something like that. Mm-hmm. Um, but uh, in the late 70s, early 80s, these things called diagnosis-related groups or DRGs came into being. We still have them now where you simply had to check off the diagnosis from a relatively limited list. And what these psychiatrists, child psychiatrists were telling me was that they were seeing children develop more symptoms when they were diagnosed. So mm-hmm. before they might have said, you know, Johnny is somewhat awkward in his conversations uh, with other people. Now they would check off autism or um, yeah, at that time it would have been autism. And then Johnny would develop more, there, were, there would be like a wider range of behavior or same with dyslexia or any of these other diagnoses. And in my ignorance, I thought this was an ethical issue. So I started attending ethics rounds at Children's Hospital. The person who ran that was a professor at Harvard Divinity School, and there was a medical ethics program there because at that time, uh, uh, the medical ethicists at most hospitals were the chaplain. And he said, you can take this, you can go there, go in and take this program, and there's a lot of latitude. You can take any number of courses uh, at, you know, anywhere at Harvard. And I thought, well, this is cool, because I was a newspaper reporter. I didn't really focus on my studies as an undergraduate. So I stepped into an ethics class my first term with Roderick Firth, and that was it. And then I basically just, like, hung around until the philosophy department kind of got weary of me and just let me into the PhD program. (laughs) And pretty soon I realized that the ish, the thing that was interesting to me was the language and the like real world uh, things that words do. That's always been the things that interest me the most in philosophy. And so, of course, when I started reading J.L. Austin uh, with Stanley Cavell relatively early on, I was really, really gripped by, by his work. So, Nancy, you have a book out on pornography. So I have to ask this question. What is pornography? You know, that's a question I never answer. <laughs> In our um, I don't think it's quite the right question. Okay. I think it's kind of like asking, you know, what is anything and expecting kind of a philosophically precise definition, not that you are, but usually when philosophers talk about this, that's what they mean. I mean, to me, pornographic, when I think about pornography, and very casually speaking, I think I think about it the way everybody else does. It's stuff that's produced in order to sexually excite people and help them have an orgasm. And I don't, a long time ago, most philosophers and feminists gave up on drawing a line between erotica and pornography, although there are still people that are reviving that project I'm not very interested in that line. I guess I, I, to me, the very simple sort of intuitive notion of what pornography is perfectly serviceable. I remember in your book, you made some, or at least gave some uptake to the issue of, is it a, a expression? Is it actual speech? Is it just performance? So you still want to get away from that kind of distinction and just take the everyday kind of idea of what pornography is? Or does those distinctions even matter? Yeah, I mean, to me, it's those distinctions would matter if we were asking a question in which they became salient. So it depends on what we want to know about pornography or what we want to do in our work and thinking about pornography. Um, so it's not as though I think those things would never be interesting or we shouldn't make any fine distinctions, but it really depends on what it is we're trying to do. So for me, 
there are lots of things to say about pornography, but they don't necessarily depend on making those dis- distinctions a priori. Okay. So let's talk about some views on pornography, right? So there may be some people dying to at least try to figure out, is pornography good or is pornography bad? So can you <laughs> give us some arguments for either one of those camps, or for both of those camps? Uh, maybe, yeah. That's, 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 <laughs> um, so as always, I will approach uh, almost always I approach questions by indirection. I think this drives my loved ones absolutely crazy. So I apologize <laughs> to anybody who's listening to listen to you, Maisha. Um, I think um, that it's really not surprising. Uh, it's just part of what it is to be a human person that we find things arousing um, other than an, a sexual, uh, in addition to potentially a sexual advance by someone with whom we're in a committed relationship or even sort of a reciprocally open relationship or whatever. Um, so to me, it's just the case that sexuality involves potentially all of our senses and that any number of things can turn us on. And for people who are um, visual, visual pornography, that is to our sighted, visual pornography can be uh, visual images of people and s- things, uh, not even just people, all sorts of things can be very sexually arousing. In a way, I kind of sound like an idiot because this is absolutely obvious, um, I know. Um, also, you know, for some people, reading a story that describes sex in a very explicit way can be, or listening to someone tell a story, or lots and lots of things can arouse us. And Pornography has been around with us forever and ever and ever. So on, you know, uh, the drawings on cave walls, we see pornographic sketches. And the first two things that came off the printing press when it was invented were the Gutenberg Bible and pornography. Wow. The Gutenberg press was invented by a man and what came off the presses was controlled by men. Um, so I, I certainly don't want to say that this is just a ho-hum uh, natural phenomenon among human beings that they get turned on by these sorts of things. I do think that it really, really matters that kind of the control of media um, has been uh, for most of human history in the hands of men and that we live in a really, really sexist world. So that that skews things to me. You mentioned the objectification argument as probably one of the most popular kind of anti-porn argument. So can you tell us what is the objectification argument, and why do you find that problematic or the use of it problematic? Yeah, so the idea is that what's wrong with pornography is that it, let's just just talk about pornography that involves objectification of women, just to make it simple. Mm -hmm. Um, So the idea is that what's wrong with pornography is that it objectifies women. It makes them into things that are just there to be used and potentially abused or, or even likely abused by men. There are other people who make a more, rather than make that kind of political argument, they make, or quasi-moral political argument, they make a full-on moral claim that objectification is just a really bad thing. We should never objectify another person. We should never use another person as an object for our purposes. And to my mind, I've not participated so much in that argument because I don't think that objectification is the right place to uh, focus our philosophical attention. There's a famous paper by Martha Nussbaum, I think it's the locus classicus of of this conversation ever since it was published in the early 1990s by Martha Nussbaum called Objectification. And she makes the argument that there are many, many different features of objectification. I think she lists seven or so of them, nine, I can't remember off the top of my head. And she wants to point out that not all instances of uh, human behavior that involve these kinds of features count as objectification. So a good example she gives is that I can take a nap on my lover's, with my head on my lover's belly. I could do this even though I would be using my lover's belly as a pillow and therefore as an object, it doesn't count as an objectification because it's in the context of a loving relationship in which da 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 To me, that's all screamingly obvious. We don't need a philosopher to point it out to us. The only reason, and and Martha's a wonderful philosopher, and there's a reason that paper is the locus classicus, but we don't really need a philosopher to tell us that that's not necessarily a bad thing. It, it wouldn't, it's, it's, we, I think, and I, here I follow Simone de Beauvoir, that it is inevitable 
that we will not be able in every moment to um, have relationships with other people in which we are fully acknowledging their subjectivity without it being a moral calamity. Um, so, for example, you know, I'm walking into a concert and there's a person there who's uh, taking tickets and is very busy and just sort of grabs mine and gives me mine back. There's not even time for me to say thank you or hello. Is that a treatment of that person as objectification? No. Is it objectable, objectionable? No. <laughs> I think just think there are tons and tons of cases like that. And uh, I also think that in sexual contexts, people sometimes enjoy the relief of having somebody focus on their body as opposed to exhaustion of having to sort of be a subject for someone all the time. I just don't yeah. think this is a disaster. I do think, however, and this is one of the things I argue in the book, that in the culture at large now and all, for, a long, for pretty much in many contexts for you know, centuries, women are endlessly encouraged to self-objectify and in two ways. One is they're encouraged to present themselves as sexually attractive in a kind of generic way um, that is dictated by the media uh, in the world to men. And secondly, they there's absolutely no emphasis on women's pleasure. Sometimes self-objectification can be pleasurable if you draw the kind of attention that you want but I think there are lots of ways in which the way that women have been and now are supposed to objectify themselves is just not pleasurable. It's disappointing. It uh, involves a kind of disciplining of one's body and of one's appearance that is uh, strenuous and doesn't always reap the kinds of uh, rewards that one thinks it will. So I've talked about that as well. And what I've said about the, all of the huge literature on what objectification is and why it's bad it's like, if you're a feminist, you just see objectification in the world. It's just there. Yeah. It's just something you experience. There's, we don't need a philosopher to rush in and justify it. I, I'm really opposed to that way of proceeding philosophically. I just think we're, we're uh, not doing our, what we owe the public for supporting us in institutions if we're doing that kind of work. You alluded to this, this earlier, but I want to kind of dive into this in more detail. What made you think of, of Austin when doing work on pornography? And how does your reading of his work inform your view? Yeah, that's a really great question. So for me, um, one of the, as I told you, from the very beginning, I was interested in Austin because I, I, the way I read him and still read him, and by the way, it's different from the way that Cavell reads him, because people often think, oh, I should just pick this up from Cavell. And I would be absolutely thrilled to have just picked up something from Cavell. <laughs> so I picked up from Cavell. But he doesn't go as far as I do in what the radical reading I have um, of Austin. But Austin is really interested in what, unfortunately, to my mind, uh, philosophers call the pragmatics of our speech. That is to say, as Austin discusses, many philosophers work on things in language, divide up various uh, ways to approach it and into three categories, syntax, semantics, and pragmatics. So the syntax stuff, which gets worked on ling by linguistics and by philosophers interested in linguistics, sort of has to get worked out. And the semantics is where the action has been uh, for a long time in philosophy of language, um, and analytic philosophy of language. And the idea is we have to figure out how, you know, words hook onto the world, how they mean what they mean. And then after that, of course, how they actually work, we will have to determine by doing pragmatics, and we'll do that later. The key thing is semantics. My thing is that what Austin is saying is that you can't separate three things, and you have to look at what he calls the total speech act and the total situation. And what this means is that every time, uh, and what he thinks dr is driving speech acts, sorry, um, is that they do things. So right now, for example, I am performing the act of elaborating, that's the, the doing, uh, a view that I have, but I'm also explaining why I find Austin important, important and lots of um, other uh, verbs could be used to describe the action I'm doing. And one of the things I argue is that Austin thinks that as we are talking, we are often positioning ourselves in the world in relation to other people. We are trying to make clear where we stand um, with respect to our own words, the way that we're living, and other people, and particularly our interlocutors. So put that aside for a second. What really started this book going is that um, in the early 2000s, Sally Haslinger at MIT was doing a little January term 
kind of workshoppy conference thing, and she called me and said, uh, oh, will you do this thing on Ray Langton's speech act and unspeak blacks? Will you comment on it? And I said, who's Ray Langton and what's speech acts and unspeakable acts? Because I wasn't working sort of in the straight down the middle of the road analytic philosophy. I'm kind of neither fish nor fowl. So I said, oh, well, I'll read that. That's interesting to me. I'll, and I read it, and it, I knew, immediate, I thought, I it immediately admired its virtuosity as a piece of argumentation and as a piece of philosophical writing. But at the same time, I thought it was kind of much ado about nothing. The argument was that pornography is speech that at the same time, as much speech does, is a kind of action. And that Pornography does things. It doesn't just say things. And given where I was coming from, I thought, well, duh. I mean, all speech say things. I just thought that was like really, really a bizarre argument. So that's kind of what's and, – and in order to make the point that, that uh, she was making, Ray really focused on uh, the sort of standard reading of Austin on which pornography, she argued, pornographic speech, including obviously films and photographs, has the power to subordinate women and to silence them in the sense that it makes it impossible for women to refuse sex because the no that they say when they're refusing sex to, because of pornography doesn't come off as a refusal, but as a kind of coy move in a certain kind of uh, language game. And I just thought this was totally wrong. Um, so I just sort of gave a thing and I said, well, da 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 And this kind of just snowballed um, this one event into um, my thinking a lot about articulating my views of Austin and trying to shift the conversation about pornography so that it was actually about com- pornography and its complexities and not just a kind of nice and neat argument about pornography's illocutionary power, as Austin would put it, or as, as Ray Langton thinks Austin would put it. And then Ray moved happily and wonderfully to MIT shortly thereafter. So I had many, many occasions on which to discuss um, these matters with her. That enormous was enormously, enormously helpful. Nancy, can I be a feminist and enjoy non-feminist porn? It kind of depends on what the can means. <laughs> um, I mean, physiologically, yeah, sure. I mean, I think people are often turned on by stuff that they wouldn't necessarily morally approve of. And this is true even outside the realm of pornography. So, for example, somebody who decides for principled reasons to be a vegetarian um, could be tempted to eat some meat. Even if they were able to resist the temptation, they could still be, in effect, as it were, turned on by the prospect of eating meat. So yes, in that simple sense, you could. The other issue is, though, whether what non-feminist porn is. So let's say that non-feminist porn is porn in which a woman is shown being demeaned, having no agency, in which the sexual pleasure that she takes from whatever's going on in the pornography or appears to be taking like a a look of of elation on her face doesn't seem in the cold light of day to be what you would expect from what's happening to her and in which there's you know a lot of the the, it's it's women are just shown endlessly over and over again enjoying things that uh, that women very well may not actually enjoy in real life like for example being penetrated with no buildup of any kind. (laughs) Um, So let's call that like non-feminist porn. Then again, you know, it kind of depends, I think, on the context. I don't think it's a moral sin to find oneself turned on by that kind of porn. On the other hand, what's a problem from my point of view is that there's so much porn like that, and it's very, very easy for um, people to get conditioned to watching that kind of porn, And as, uh, as you know. Anne Eaton has written about how people get conditioned to look at various kinds of porn. I also think, though, that some people just are, uh, to be very technical about this, kind of just have these pervy things about them. Yeah, everybody (laughs) does. Everybody's, that's what Freud was right about this. So everybody's kind of pervy in various ways. And so who knows? It's why some things turn us on and some things don't. They may be hardwired. They may be simple reasons. But the issue would be if someone routinely finds that only really misogynistic porn can get them going. That would be concerning for obvious reasons. Um, But I think it's complicated. I really do. And I say this having four children between the ages of 19 and week 25. I think that the major problem with porn in our era is that kids are learning about sex from porn um, very young. 
I mean, they are, by the time they're 10, if they live with, in a world in which the Internet is everywhere and they're access, it's accessible to them, they have seen a porn, and in many cases, lots of porn. And the problem is, in, to my mind, and I talk about this in the book, uh, there are many, many problems. But one major problem that I am particularly interested in is that in porn, almost always, there are no horrendous consequences of whatever it is that happens. Mostly, everybody has an orgasm, or at least they're okay, or they're fine, or everything's okay. And in lots of porn, you know, everybody, even in fetish porn, everybody looks the way that you want them to look. So, for example, in fat porn, people who are turned on by that, everybody looks the way they want to look, and everybody has an orgasm, or everything is okay. In the book, I talk about how, in his famous book, Civilization and Its Discontents, Freud talks about civilization as a byproduct of our sublimation of sort of erotic in the broadest sense of the terms desires. So, you know, your little baby, what do you desire? You want to eat, you want to sleep, you want to pee and poop. And you just do those whenever you want. <laughs> you don't do them when you don't want to. Um, and we learn later on that you can't just pee and poop whenever you want. You can't just sleep. And you're sort of constantly uh, socialized so that you're controlling yourself. And that kind of control produces, you know, architects and philosophers and, and taxi drivers and whatever, people who are doing sort of productive things. So channeling art, broadly erotic energy, not necessarily sexualized, but into the rest of the world. But what Freud thought was that uh, uh, like unbound erotic energy is incompatible with civilization. And in porn, there's never that tension. So, you know, the woman cleaning her, the housewife cleaning her home, her middle class home, uh, answers the door and there's the mailman. And in five seconds, they're just humping all over the room and then the mailman leaves, but the mail still gets delivered. The house is immaculate. Um, everything gets done. It's like you can have it all. You know, I think the fact of the matter, though, is that kids learn from pornography that it's great. Sex is great. You always have an orgasm. Everybody ends up being okay, even if they're hurt or bruised or whatever they are. And we don't give them any other kind of counter narrative. So what we do is we go into schools ever since HIV. Uh, we've basically been doing the same thing. And we say, here, kids, have some condoms. Make sure you get consent. Never really explained or what that looks like from the other person. Make sure the person really wants to do it with you. And then have a condom and good luck. But the kids have this whole other powerful eroticized narrative in front of them. And to me, this is like a major problem with porn. So Mississippi just passed an anti-LGBT law, but they also ranked six overall and a number of gay scenes screamed on the website Gamely. North Carolina also passed an anti-LGBT law that prohibits trans men and women from using bathrooms that align with their gender identity. But similarly, North Carolina tops three porn videos or porn videos involving trans porn stars. How would you explain this? I, I don't know that I'm in a better position than anybody else to explain this. But I do think that what is taboo is sexy for many people. And so one of the things that's interesting is that it's hard to know how to talk to kids, even if people wanted to, in sort of frank terms about what actual sex is really like. So as I sometimes say, you know, sometimes you have sex with someone that you're fond of and you care about or even in love with or married to or whatever, because you just really care about them. And even though you don't feel like it, you just do it anyway in the same way that you would do anything with them that you didn't feel yeah. like doing. Yeah. And it's okay. Other times you really want to do it, but it's not going well, uh, but it is consensual, but you just kind of want to, you know, rather than stop it in the middle for whatever reason, because you love the person or whatever, you instead like make a grocery list in your head uh, or another time, you know, you know, note to self, don't have sex with this person again or whatever, but you, you know, this is very complicated. And I think we should talk to people about that. All of that said, I think for many people, a lot of what's sexy, what's turns them on are things that are taboo. So they get sexually charged for some people. Obviously, I am not a uh, an experimental psychologist. I don't have any data to support this. But I do think it's not surprising that um, if you live in a state uh, like, for example, Mississippi or North Carolina, in which there's a very heavy fundamentalist Christian presence, 
and a very a very strong set of taboos, it's not surprising that those taboos become eroticized. I want to say too, because we haven't talked about this yet, I also think that the one of the most disturbing features of a lot of mainstream porn is how racist it is. Yeah. And some of it's just, you know, African and American men have penises the size of the Eiffel Tower and so forth. And, you know, and African American women are voracious and one sex all the time. But a lot of it is sort of just this taboo of the sort of out of central casting white man just really wanting to have sex with black man or black woman and so that stuff is obviously really really disturbing but i link it uh, with the the kind of stuff you're talking about which is it's a way of people working out the way that they've kind of connected these things they, they think of as taboo and it's it's very disturbing <laughs> and it's also very ironic and, you know, it's not that uncommon. It's almost a, a trope of the sort of famous fundamentalist uh, preacher at a mega church who, it turns out, is, you know, having sex with men. This yeah. happens over and over again. And I think it's kind of the same phenomenon. It doesn't surprise me at all. What is your view on, on hookup culture? Also on apps that kind of promote hookup culture like Grindr and Tinder. To me, hookup culture, I don't have any problem at all with people sort of meeting one another and having casual sex, or even people going online and seeking casual sex with someone else. I think if, if both people want to do that and they want to do that on Grinder or whatever, all good. However, at the same time, and again, I say this in part because of having all these children who are uh, the oldest one is about, it sounds like another year before their prefrontal cortex actually uh, gets enough to do it. Um, I think there's just a lot of pressure on kids, like sort of not social pressure, but sort of psychological pressure to think that hooking up is, is going to be like a really great way to get the sex that you want. Sometimes it might be, sometimes it is. In some sexual subcultures, it's a, been a common way for generations, in part because of, of relationships between people having to be taboo to, to have sexual pleasure. But I think especially when it comes to heterosexual women or women who have, or bisexual women who have sex with men, it's often the case, I think, that a hookup is, may not be as is, is complicated and may not be a simple desire for sex and, and can produce what uh, many, many, many young women have have told me is something I call a hookup hangover where you think this is going to be a great thing and then it just doesn't go as well as you thought it would and it's kind of awkward and embarrassing or it's sort of sad or something I mean that could happen in any sexual encounter I think it actually in the heterosexual world is in some respects better for men and some of that I think is to some extent physiological I mean boys have and again let me be clear this would be um, cisgendered men or men with people with penises so there are men who don't have penises that's fine but um, a person with a penis who's had a penis from birth in particular they have this organ I just think this is physiologically salient that is <laughs> there in front of their body that has erections that's interesting that they're bound to play with when they're little Little girls may sort of rub their crotches on things or, or understand that there's some stuff down there. I think it's much more unlikely that little girls would really get to know their sexual organs in the same way that little boys do. This is a point that Simone de Beauvoir makes, and I think it's true. It doesn't mean anything essentialist. It's just, I think, plausible. And so it may be the case that an adolescent boy has much more understanding of how to get off than a girl does. And I think it can be, we all know, harder to deal with clitorises and G-spots and vaginas and all that stuff. So I think the hooks are uh, likely to be more satisfying in some instances for boys than girls. So to me, there's a way in which the hookup culture makes things difficult sexually for women. But the other thing, too, is that I think that some, uh, for some girls, their sense of self-esteem comes from feeling that they are sexually attractive to boys and their sense of desire for sexual pleasure in some instances uh, takes a back seat to that. And that I find worrisome. And frankly, I think advertising culture more than porn is a dominant force in acclimating young girls to that, to that mindset very early on. And then, of course, they start seeing porn now at a young age too and so they get the sense that this is just that it's something about them if they are not having an orgasm they they just uh or if they're not enjoying the encounter that this is just what they should be like how 
has your your former reporter life influenced or had an impact on your present now professional philosopher life? I wish I could say that. It, um, well, I don't know if I wish I could say this. Obviously, I haven't. I don't do empirical research. Other than I have to tell you, I've been doing this work now for a long, long time. I started it in 2015. Well, that's one year. 2000. And- <laughs> Oh boy. 15 years ago, like 2001 is when I started this. And I have been spending a lot of time that whole time just talking to audiences of girls, my students. Um, I've given many, many, many talks in all sorts of contexts on this material. And I used to think when I first started hearing about this stuff at Tufts, where I teach, that there was something really messed up about Tufts. I was like, wow, this stuff goes on. This is crazy, like the kind of hooking up stuff that I was hearing about. And then I realized I gave a talk in France in the mid-2000s on, on this, and all these French young women came up to me afterwards and said, it's exactly like that here. And But other than that, I really haven't done empirical stuff. I think the hugest impact is that I am a plain speaker and a plain writer, and I don't think I've ever written anything that an interested lay person couldn't pick up and immediately start to follow. Yeah. Um, I, I actually, I'm a, I'm a dean now at Tufts also, and I. A very reluctant dean in many respects, in part because I don't want to talk about how we're going to leverage our resources in a planful way to produce transformational experiences. You know, all, I don't talk that way. And in my philosophizing, I think it's really, really important to use plain English. This has nothing to do with Austin and ordinary language, though yeah. Austin was, it's not a coincidence that Austin was just a magnificent writer, in my opinion. But I think that's the way that it's most influenced. I feel this incredible need to, to use plain language as much as possible. And, and also, I guess... Although I haven't written that much uh, for the general public, I do feel like it's critical that anybody could pick up stuff I wrote and follow what I'm saying. So this may be a similar question, and hopefully it doesn't make you feel uncomfortable. But in Amia Srinivasan's Eastern APA comments on your book, this is what she writes, quote, But at times I feared that being a philosopher and being a public thinker were simply two different things, involving two different and incompatible orientations to the world. And that for better or worse, I had made my bid in philosophy and now had to lie in it. But Nancy's early M plus one piece, and indeed all of her work, shows that this dichotomy I so feared was a false one, end quote. What do you think it is about your work that leads me and others to think this way? You know, it's interesting because I must say that those comments, uh, I was also lucky enough at that session to have Anne Eaton comment as well, were just so wonderful. And I really appreciated what Amiya said here. I felt like this was... uh, an achievement for me. <laughs> um, I don't think that, in fact, not only do you not think that being a philosopher and being a public thinker are two different things, I think that if they're not the same thing, then we end up having conversations about things that are unconnected, not only to the world, but to the phenomenon we thought we were talking about. And in this respect, I'm a Wittgensteinian. Um, so here's a Cavell influence again. So, you know, for example, there's an enormous philosophical literature in the last, I mean, from the beginning of time, but in a very particular way on what constitutes knowledge. So Gettier, the Gettier problem of uh, whether or not it's okay to just say that knowledge is justified true belief or that whether we have to have a connection between the truth and the justification and so forth, all that whole literature. So people talk on and on about knowledge, knowledge, knowledge. But after a while, I feel like, are they really talking about knowledge in terms of how human beings think about that and why it matters? I mean, as Austin points out, when we say, this is in his essay, Other Minds, when we use the word no, often what we are are doing is staking ourselves on the claim that we're making. So whether it's a scientist saying something like, we know now that speciation occurs only when da 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 what they mean is not this will never ever be uh, precisified or even overturned. What they mean is uh, we have a lot of confidence that this is the way things are. We are we feel we're ready to stake ourselves on it. We have a tremendous amount of confidence. And often I think when you really look at how people talk about use the concept of knowledge, that's what's going on. When you get into this extremely technical philosophical discourse, I think you can start talking about something that isn't quite what the ordinary English word knowledge or its uh, various forms knowing is. So to me, there's a philosophical risk 
to highly technical um, discussions just within the profession. And I should say, too, um, the dean job I had until just a few (laughs) weeks ago, um, I still have a dean job, but it's shifted, had me supervising departments across arts and sciences. So I have biology and anthropology and education and religion and drama and any number of other departments. And what I saw is that every field, of course, has this tendency because of the sort of intense requirement to publish peer-reviewed articles in journals that only other practitioners of your field or other highly trained people can read. Every field has a tendency to have these drifts into meaninglessness in a way, or drifts away from the motivating questions that are determining the discourse. And I think a lot of fields now are experiencing this need for a kind of grounding for a number of reasons. But this, to me, is at the heart and soul of everything I do in philosophy. And it's why I love Simone de Beauvoir so much and come back to her all the time. My first book was on Beauvoir. I've written a lot about her. And I think she was able to hold her philosophizing and her life and sort of ordinary life in the same space. And so I really take my cues from her. You say in your book that we, we've lost sight of what philosophy is what it's good for, and what it can do. So I want to throw these questions back at you. It seems to me that what philosophers do is they take the ordinary and, it, and look at it in a way that it becomes extraordinary or puzzling. So philosophy is about finding oneself unhinged by a shift in perspective. So uh, again, here I, not again, but here I always, always, always recur to talking about Socrates, who in the Republic talks about how what, or basically I think what philosophy Socrates practice is, at least in the early Platonic dialogues, is to speak with people until their understanding of what they're doing is, is in a way, just cleared. It, become, they, they, it suddenly starts to seem strange and, and indefensible. And so philosophy involves inducing a shift in consciousness or perspective, both in the philosopher um, and in the, the one's interlocutors. It involves seeing the familiar as, as something odd. And you asked what philosophy is good for. That's often a really great thing. So, for example, take the people that you were talking about in Mississippi and North Carolina mm-hmm. and based on the anti-horrendous um, legislation <laughs> and yet the practices of what people do. It, sort of putting those two things in the same space shows that there's something very odd going on, which is why you asked me the question. And a philosopher can do that kind of thing and ask that kind of question. Other people can too. But what philosophers are interested in, abidingly interested in, is taking what seems obvious or unobjectable or boring. And this is true, I think, for everyone, even for the kind of philosophy I'm not don't particularly find uh, compelling and doing that. And that is a really good thing to do. It's to ask people to reflect on their settled beliefs, but it requires first uh, an incentive for somebody to have what I sometimes call a gestalt shift in their perspective. And that's what Socrates was able to do. The example I always use is with Euthyphro. Euthyphro is um, feeling like really good about himself because even though it's painful, his father has committed an act of impiety and needs to be sentenced in a court, which is what Euthyphro is trying to do. And the penalty for that will be to be put to death. So Euthyphro feels like really uh, like a sterling person for doing this. And Socrates meets Euthyphro coming out of the courthouse and says, hey, I say, hey, you're doing this whole thing. And by the end of it, Euthyphro is like undone. Euthyphro says, wait a minute, I, I, maybe that's not the way to go. And philosophers always, our job, I think, is to say, to the, is to point out to the culture <laughs> the various contradictions, like the ones you pointed out with, those, with the laws and the porn behavior. And we have to do this with humility because we are no less vulnerable. And I, so I believe that Socrates was not being ironic. I think Socrates, what he said he didn't know, really didn't know. <laughs> and that's the, that kind of humility, I think, is critical to philosophizing. Nancy, thank you so much for this conversation. I enjoyed it. Totally my pleasure, Maisha. Thanks for putting <laughs> all my long answers and my rambling. Great questions and just a pleasure. For more access to the Unmute Podcast, subscribe on iTunes or head over to the website at www.unmutepodcast.co. There you can get more information about our guests, participate in giveaways, as well as learn more about people, books, and concepts mentioned in today's episode. Until next time, remember that your silence will not protect you. Listen, think, speak. The world will be different as a result.